Welcome to the Soccer Coaching Theory Podcast. This is episode one in what will be a bi-weekly podcast where I discuss how to connect academic theory to practice session design. Now, I know a lot of people are going to ask, um, what do you mean by connecting academic theory to practice session design? Well, that's exactly why I started this podcast. My passion for over the past 30 plus years in coaching soccer has been focused on player development. I started my career basically studying everything I could find at all levels of coaching from Tony Waiters, micro soccer, 3v3, 4v4, to the Corvair training, to the winning formula from the English FA, to Victor Freyd's tactical periodization, to the ideas of the Spanish positional play, and everything in between. So from the early days also of you know inverting the pyramid where most players play up top and the ideas of zonal defending with Saki and the Italian 442 to Clockwork Orange and total football with the Dutch. So my my coaching journey started at a very young age of just 18 years old. I then went on to college and studied physical education, exercise science with a minor in athletic coaching at Central Connecticut State University. And as time went on through my coaching career, I started to question um, the ideas and the methodologies behind everything that I was learning. So After my first 20 years of coaching, I stumbled upon the idea of applying academic theory to practice session design. Now, the first academic theory that I spent years of studying was called cognitive processing theory, right? And this was based upon cognitive science, uh, cognitive psychology, and neuroscience. And perhaps you heard of Michael, I'm gonna kill his last name here, but Brulenix from Belgium. He was really the innovator in applying cognitive theory to practice session design and really created his own unique methodology in this area. And I was totally immersed in his ideas. I went to see him um, speak uh, in person and it was nice. I I had a chance to sit down and ask him some questions personally and well, you know, as well. And it really sent me down this rabbit hole that was so fascinating for me. And after a number of years researching and applying like the cognitive theory to practice session design and fitting that into kind of a loose methodology, I stumbled upon another academic theory, which was invented by Gibson called ecological dynamics. And this theory really forever changed the way that I personally view player development and coaching overall. Now, this theory has become the foundation of everything that I do on the soccer field. Now, before I explain like the basics of ecological dynamics, let's first look at the word theory, what it actually means. And theory in itself is just a set of principles on which the practice of an activity is based. So if you're gonna go out to the soccer field, you want to have a set of principles on which that activity is paid, is based and those principles come from a theory. And this connection was huge for me. So everything I do now in training is related to the principles of ecological dynamics. Now, my simple explanation of ecological dynamics is the following. Um, if you were to catch a baseball, right, and the baseball is hit from a bat, the ball is going to reflect light from the ball to your eye. Now, this reflection of light changes as the ball travels towards you. And this can actually mathematically, you could deduct this as it travels for, you know, towards you, um, the reflection becomes different to tell you that it's getting closer to you, the speed and the size and so forth. So you could actually mathematically work this out of when it's going to get to your hand by the reflection of light. Now, the interesting part is in order to catch that ball, the player, you must couple your physical actions to match the information that's being generated from that reflection of light in this real-time feedback loop that happens automatically. So if I was to throw an object at your head, you are going to move so it doesn't hit your head. This is not a skill set that needs to be trained. 
it's really the reflection of a light that's coming from the object that's coming at your head in real time. You don't have to practice that. You're just going to move. So ecological dynamics does not think that your brain is this supercomputer that computes all these things out at the speed of light that lead to you making an action. That would be considered a cognitive processing model where A plus B equals action C. And the cognitive processing theory says a player, you know, basically reaches into their memory or their prior patterns to identify an action or solution. And I no longer sub subscribe to those beliefs anymore for a number of reasons that I will get into in later episodes of this show. But I now subscribe to the ecological dynamics approach. And I'm going to give you a kind of fancy definition of this approach. And then I'm going to give you kind of my coach's explanation of what ecological dynamics approach is. So ecological dynamics is a systems oriented theoretical framework which conceptualizes the sport performers as complex adaptive systems. It seeks to understand the adaptive relations that emerge during coordination of interactions between each performer, performer in a specific performance environment. So that's the scientific definition. Now here's my definition. Soccer is a chaotic, unpredictable sport that is always changing. Players are part of this complex environment in real time. The player has to access this information through what we call direct perception of the environment. This is mainly done through your eyes, seeing, visual. Players are in this feedback loop, constant feedback loop, are, gu are guided by what actions are possible. This is called an affordance, right? What action capabilities can the player perform to eventually help achieve the desired outcome of the game, which normally is to score more goals than the opponent, a simple invasion game, right? So players' intentions are what options are open for actions. That's where their intentions are going to be. And this is guided by what their perceived affordances are. What do they think they're capable of doing? So if a player has never done a bicycle kick and they get a ball that's crossed, even though it's direct perception of the environment, so you're in this real-time feedback loop, because they've never done a bicycle kick, they're probably not going to do it in real time. Their intentions aren't even going to go there because they don't even know that's possible. And instead, they'll probably just try to head the ball into the goal, where if there was another player who could do a bicycle kick, they'll get the same information, but their intentions will be different because they can do the bicycle kick. So they'll get something different from this environment. So, so basically, um, players, will ch players with intentions, players can also change their intentions in a fraction of a second because of information in this feedback loop. Now, they don't have to compute and access memories from the past or prior patterns to complete shifting their intentions. This is, this is why like a soccer player wouldn't just pick the ball up and start running with the ball with his hands. He doesn't have to access or she doesn't have to access the memory of the rules of the game. The memory's there. They have the memory of the rule of the game. But they don't have to access. There's nothing in this environment that's telling them they need to access a memory of not to use their hands, right? So I just gave you kind of the tiniest introduction into the theory of ecological dynamics. Now, from theory, we need to progress to practice session design. We have to take the ideas, the principles behind the theory, put it into practice, and from a practice session design, we can eventually progress to building or creating what we would call a methodology. So theory is what is behind a methodology, which by definition, methodology is a way to teach the game, say, of soccer through the levels. It's not a curriculum. A curriculum is simply a list of topics that you want to co cover in no particular order. A curriculum is not a methodology. 
in a theory is not a method methodology. So practice session design is obviously directly connected to theory, which fits into the larger picture, which is the overall methodology. Now, my personal methodology I've been working on for years, and I am constantly changing my methodology and tweaking it, and it's a, it's a flexible work of art, I'll call it. So in my own personal methodology, um, based upon the theory of ecological dynamics, it covers all the way from 4v4 game model to a 11v11 game model. Now, I divided my methodology into, sh into sections, and I color-coded them, and I also color code my entire training week. So my methodology is as follows. I have small area possession, which is also kind of a self-organizing activity because possession is not positional. It's more chaotic. And small area positional exercises. Then I have medium to large area possession, which is self-organizing and positional. Then I have constraint-based exercises, which can, the use of constraints is, is a major focus of my methodology. Now, constraint-based exercises are worked into the small, the medium, and the large area exercises. And then I have supplemental exercises. And the supplemental exercises are, could be finishing, could be passing, whatever it is. Now, all these kind of go in one circle. They're not really split up so so precisely. So I'll go over the color codes really quick. So like a blue day does not have to be game model related. It could be very complex. It could be constraint based. There's going to be loads of decision making. There, I'll take away some possibilities. I'll open up other possibilities. So that's a blue day. A red day is a tactical day. That's like phase of play. How are we going to get ready for our next opponent on Saturday? We'll use position specific. It'll be the right distances on a, on a big field. That's our red tactical day. Green is a fitness. And for me, fitness, you, you can combine green and red and blue days together. I, I try to the best of my ability never to separate fitness from what we're doing on the field. And then the yellow day is a match day review, the, the day before the match. So that's kind of how I color coded and what makes up my methodology. Um, but everything, I can take every single exercises, exercise in those categories. And if you ask me, why am I training this way? I can, I can tell you exactly practice session design. And here's the academic theory that applies to why my practice is, is made. Why did I create a practice environment um, like I did? And the arrow will point straight to the areas of academic um, theory to, to back up why I did that. So if you look on my YouTube station, which is um, just my first and last name, the DiBernardo Soccer Methodology, Marcus DiBernardo, you'll see that my YouTube playlists are set up in, in the categories of my methodology. So for episode one, what I'm going to do with all these episodes is I'm going to take some important ideas from the academic side of ecological dynamics, and I want to start to introduce terms to you and how that fits into theory and how that goes into training session design. So the first term, this is the most simple one that I, that I could think of, was something called representative game design. Now, Words matter, and the more words, so you kind of have an academic side, right? And then you have coaches who've been coaching forever, and sometimes the academics and the coaches never get together. And both the coach and the academic side have so much to learn from each other. Um, language is one of the things that the coaches really need to start to study um, and learn from the academic side. I think it helps um, it helps a lot out a lot in understanding theory. So the first one, and one of the reasons why words matter so much is words don't necessarily translate into action so well. So it's really, really important to choose the right words so players can understand and coaches can understand what that is supposed to be connecting to. 
Um, so rep representative game design in simple terms. This is our first term. Does it look like soccer? That's as simple as I can put it. The question is, how representative does it need to be to be valuable in player development? Now, there's other considerations to this too, like fully representative is going to be a real game, right? Maybe it's a real 11-a-side game. Well, a real 11-a-side game comes with a high workload and a big chance for injury. So how representative is representative enough? You're not going to do that the, the day before a match, right? So is there still real value if it's not fully 100% representative? So I have a, a wide range of flexibility with this term. So let's just start off with like a soccer rondo, for example. So maybe it's a rondo that doesn't have goals, it doesn't have a direction, there's no scoring, and it's not positional. Is there any value to such a simple exercise? My answer is overwhelmingly, yes, there is. So if a defender or two defenders close me down and try to steal the ball, I need to be able to identify how to manipulate time and space. Basically, don't lose the ball. The action in itself is real. And it's real to the actual game. I'm coupling my actions to that, in, to that rich information environment in ecological dynamics. So by itself, if all you ever practice was a tiny little rondo, probably not good enough, right? But that's just one small environment that my players encounter in my training sessions. And it serves an important role. And furthermore, like, I love like a 4v1 rondo. Could be one touch. It could be mandatory two touch. Depends. Now, why? Because it's not physically demanding, but you still have to make meaningful decisions in a 5x5 five five yard area. It can be transitional. can be one touch. could be two touch where you have to adjust your body positions and you have to... Um, basically open up your hips a little bit differently. You, it's, it adds variability, right? So those, those things are, are really good. And you still don't have a ton of work rate this like this. So it's great to warm up the body compared to just an isolated physical activity or some technical skill that's combined with a physical activity. And I'm not saying that your warm up needs to be this or that. But for me personally, you're learning to manipulate time and space with a soccer ball in a game representative of enough training as part of your warm up you're making decisions meaningful decisions on the ball i think that's great so from an academic theory perspective it is game representative enough it connects theory to practice session design i can add variability which is another component of theory to the exercises and they can they can be, rondos can be made so they're not really separated into parts because we're going to get into that a little bit in future podcasts about whole versus separating the game into pieces. And we know that if you separate the game into pieces, you have attacking organization, you have defensive organization, attacking transition, defensive transition. You have four different separate pieces in what we would call the whole, you might want to call set pieces a fifth piece if you wanted to. But the idea is, can we play in the whole instead of focusing on just one piece? Because it's not as realistic. And for me, Rondo can be almost a whole. Where if the guy in the, if you lose the ball, you have to sprint around a cone and you run back into the Rondo grid as the ball is continuously moving. We haven't missed a beat. There was no stoppage of play. And we're continuing to make it as whole as possible in this representative enough, this game representative enough environment. Now, you could talk about maybe a goalkeeper if, if you're working to a collapse dive to the left, right? Well, that is not as game representative because the goalkeeper knows you're kicking the ball to the left. Well, what if you don't tell them if it's to the left or the right? Now there is variability, right? This makes it more game representative. And now maybe you weren't kicking a, a, a ball that's stationary. Maybe now you're dribbling and you're kicking to the left or the right. That's even more game representative, right? And these are things that the talk of game representative is the first thing 
that we want to say, when I connect my theory of ecological dynamics to training session design, is it, and these are questions you have to ask yourself, is it game representative enough? And some things to me that stand out of if there's cones and kids are stationary at cones and there's preset movements and that there's not a lot of game representative in that sort of a situation because it's not live decision making. It's players on cones. It's preset movement patterns. I would tend to take a step back from those type of training sessions because it's not relating to this game representative um, principle in ecological dynamics. So hopefully you enjoyed this first podcast. I'm going to strive to put this out every two weeks where I connect academic theory to training session design. Now, I do consider just about me some limited consulting projects. So if you want to email me any inquiries, coachdebernardo at gmail.com. I'm happy to take a look at it and get back to you. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel, my Instagram. You can check out my blog. I have books and courses on sale and all that kind of stuff as well. But I'm happy to kick off, finally kick off this this first podcast in, in a coaching, soccer coaching theory podcast because it's it really is when it comes down to it, even though I've been coaching 30 years at all different levels of the game, my passion is player development and connecting academic theory to training session design at all levels of the game and putting that into a working soccer methodology that is a progressive way to teach the game from four years old to 18 years old and everywhere in between. So I look forward to, to, uh, coming out with episode two and keep them connected. See you.